Welcome to another weekly featured business brought to you by Visibility Impact and your host, James Moffat, where he will gracefully take our featured guest on a personal and business journey and stories that will inspire, educate, and engage you. Hello. And welcome to another Friday featured business, although not Friday today, it's actually a Wednesday. So welcome to Wednesday's featured business. And today we have our 142nd guest, Robert Taylor. So uh, featured business is actually brought to you by Visibility Impact and your host, myself, James Moffat. So let's make a start. So the 142nd guest, numbers actually mean a lot to me. So Robert, does 142 have any significance? Don't think so. Can't think of anything, 142. Yes. The meaning of life, isn't it, is 42. Yeah. Yeah. I could never quite work that one out. It was. It went above my head. No, I, I, I don't know where their 42 came from, but uh, yeah, it would be nice actually to find out why they said 42. If if you watch the movie, of course, which was The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Hitchhiker's Guide, yeah, D- Douglas Adams. Yeah, exactly. Great movie. Well, and a great book. And talking about books, we will be mentioning that this is how we met. We met through uh, our uh, publisher, yeah, and in London, uh, Paul Smith Publishing, and yeah, I've met a lot of his authors, and they have been guests or wish to be guests, and great, great bunch of people. So I'm an author or plan to be an author. So we're about to release our book at the end of this year, but I think you're going to leapfrog us and you're going to beat us to it but we'll learn more about the book in a minute so before we get going robert so where are you living now and where are you originally from so i live in london now in uh southwest london um part of uh chelsea called world's end um which is sort of down at the bottom end of the king's road just as a just as chelsea sort of turns into fulham uh, which is named after the famous World's End pub where Rolling Stones and people like that played in their early days. And originally, I'm from South Wales, a place called Abertillery. Right. So I don't really uh, detect any Welsh accent there. No, the Welsh accent has kind of gone. Some people can can detect it and will say you're from wales aren't you uh but yeah i've been in london now for 35 years so it's sort of it's sort of ebbed away although i don't actually think i had much of a welsh accent ever really i think i just sort of had my own accent <laughs> from somewhere or other i don't know where yeah people say that to me because i i originally from edinburgh was right you don't sound scottish <laughs> and then i lived in newcastle Right. I uh, probably don't sound Geordie. No. Why I pet, right? And then many years in Brighton, so became a southerner. Then then London, and then the Netherlands, and now Switzerland. So, I mean, people always ask where you're from. Yeah. You can't detect the accent. No. No, I mean, people ask me, or they'll, they sometimes people think I'm South African or something. Like yes, that. Kind of exactly. Tell a bit of an accent, but they're not really sure what it is. I think that happens when you move around. People then assume that you, you must be from New Zealand, Australia, South Africa, somewhere like that. Yeah. Anyway, enough of that. So you've got a lot of things in common that I like. So we're going to touch on those as we go through. Uh, just for the viewers, I do send out a questionnaire prior to the show and great stuff this is just to help me steer the conversation and to focus on things that really resonate with me so there are a number of things that resonate with me besides being the author part which we'll talk about a bit later but let's just take you down memory lane a little bit and back to your childhood so do you have any siblings yeah i have one brother 
Uh, older, younger? Uh, he's younger by two years, um, not very much, really. Yeah, sim similar to me. I have a younger brother, uh, an older sister, and a younger sister. Oh, okay. So, bigger family. Yeah, so I was like the second one, but being the oldest brother, I mean, you have to take care of them, although sometimes they take care of you. <laughs> yeah, I was more definitely the older brother and um, always sort of wanting to do things. And I like kind of, I like being grown up. I was always one of those, one of those kids who always wanted to be more grown up than I was. And, you know, every birthday was sort of, yeah, I'm another year older now. And, of course, you get to the tipping point where you sort of start thinking, oh, God, I'm another year older now, every birthday. But, um, but yeah, as a kid, I always like, wanted to be involved with stuff and find out about things, um, that kind of stuff. No, and likewise, I mean, I, I, I felt maybe I was more mature for my age, although sometimes it didn't reflect that. Uh, but having older friends that lived in the street, and it was definitely an influence because yeah. they were a few years older that you do things, different things to maybe what you do you know, with kids your age. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. I always like to be around um, the adults and, you know, do, do things and find out about new things. And um, didn't like doing childish things, you know, with kids my own age. I think, oh, God, they're so immature. You know, I want to be, want to be out there like sort of playing with the big kids and stuff it's funny when you're young you want to be old and when you're old you want to be young yeah that's the problem i don't know what that magic number is i don't know don't know maybe around about 30 maybe i think 33 because that's 33. a <laughs> it's got a good ring to it no it's a biblical number i mean it was the year i mean the, the age of jesus right maybe. of course yeah all right so so I think that's a good year to stay at, not to die, obviously, but to stay at that, that yeah, age. Yeah, because you're kind of old enough to be able to sort of know what you want and to have had a bit of an experience, but you're not so old that it kind of seems like it's all behind you now. Exactly. So let's look at some of the interests that you had as a kid growing up. And so typically, what did you enjoy? Uh, so I've always been into cars, and uh, I think my first ambition was to be a racing driver, you know, to it was a sort of the time of people like James Hunt, and they just seemed to be sort of so kind of exciting, the cars and everything were, you know, just really glamorous and stuff and going fast and that kind of stuff. So I really, uh, that was my first ambition in life. So did you see James Hunt? No, no. I growing up in Wales, we didn't really travel very far, so I, I, I never, uh, you know, went to Grand Prix or anything. Just used to watch them on the telly. Yeah, I, actually, I think that was the only one I ever went to at Silverstone. So, and yeah, I think with Formula One in particular, that that was really bare knuckle driving in yeah. those days. I mean, now, I mean, it's like a computer game. Yeah. I'm not saying there's not skill in it, but it's it's a different game. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the cars those days, there was no sort of driver aids or anything. They were, and you know, everything was manual. So you, they were really sort of hard to drive. I think you had to be tough, strong to drive the cars. Yeah. My brother met Sterling Moss. Okay. And because they, they, they do these kind of open air museums and things and had the chance to meet him. Yeah, so I I love cars, particularly classic cars. So, can what cars? I mean, did you remember like growing up as a kid? Then, and I mean, you you said you're into cars. I mean, was it the classic cars or sports cars or? Um, yeah, I was into. I've always been into kind of to classic cars, and but I guess like a lot of people, it's sort of the cars you remember are the cars you grew up with. So for me, growing up, I was really into Lotus. Obviously, and Lotus were a top Formula One team then with the brilliant Colin Chapman, you know, sort of, when, again, one of these sort of big kind of powerful um, figures. And I love the Lotus road cars as well, the, the, Elise, uh, the Elite and the Esprit. And I did actually go to a motor show. I think it was the year they launched the 
Esprit Turbo, which is, I think, 1984, something like that, 83, 84. And I remember sitting in this car and it was just like amazing because the Esprit is like a racing car. You're sitting like right back, you're sitting up, you know, practically lying down driving the car. Uh, it's just an amazing thinking, wow, just uh, taking this on the road. So when you were old enough to drive, what type of cars did you have? So I started off with minis and had loads of minis. And uh, I was a student in London then and just blasting around London in these minis, which were probably pretty clapped out cars, but you could really drive them on the door handles, you know, sort of because, you know, you just don't slow down really in a mini. You just have to keep your foot planted on the floor and, you know, whiz through all the little gaps. So not the sort of thing I could uh, would recommend doing now, but in those days it was a lot yeah. of fun. I mean, I likewise. I, I grew up and I, I loved minis. I mean, I must. Have, I, I had like the eight fifty mini. Then I had a thousand mini, many thousand minis, yeah. and then I had a twelve seventy five GT. Yeah, I had one right. of those, right. yeah, which with the stripes and everything, which obviously made it go a lot faster. Oh, it did go fast. The GT made it go faster, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but. Yeah, I mean, it was a 1275, so it was a bit of a bigger engine. But, I mean, you, you did notice the difference. But, I mean, it was all yeah. kind of the boy racer stuff. Like, we, you put flare arches on it. You would put the wheel spacers to bring the wheels out wider. Yeah. And, yeah, and, yeah, big exhaust. Got to be a big exhaust. Got to have a big exhaust for that sort of powerful sound. And and also the, the, the uh, what was it, the, gear changer had to be a, a pool ball yeah yeah and i never had then, one of those i never got that far but yeah i've seen them yeah it's oh, like, and bucket seats of course well, bucket well, seats definitely yeah and and the full harness seat belt so you really felt like a racing driver yeah definitely so yeah i mean those were the days and great fun and you, you're right particularly with minis that you can drive them flat out and they just yeah will go forever and if they broke down you knew what was wrong with it and you could fix it yourself which was yeah. the beauty of kind of these old classic cars you didn't have to be a mechanic you just had to have some common sense yeah yeah they're very simple mechanically but yeah just kept going loved them so but you've had other cars since i mean name some of the classics you've had uh, so I've had um, a couple of 911s. Oh wow! Which yeah, we, were amazing cars. They were sort of one of my when I sort of got and had a little bit of money. Then that's I immediately wanted a 911 and uh, an Aston V8, one of the old V8 saloons, not a Vantage, but just one of the one of the sort of standard ones. But they were pretty. There was a manual. And it was pretty fast, really. You know, they were about 350 horsepower. So they could, they scooted along all right. So this was the Bond look. The Bond look. Yeah, yeah. Mine was uh, like a sort of maroon color. And it was one of the, what is it, one of the early ones. It was a 71. So it was one of the, one of the first ones in that sort of shape after the DBS when they sort of redesigned the front end. It was one of the first ones and i had it like in the end of the 80s so they were they were, were they were kind of you know you could pick them up for next to nothing in those days weren't really you know worth anything and then my my the last really fancy car i had was a maserati uh gran turismo very nice uh, which um is one of the things i share with paul because he's he's got a gran turismo as well Oh, wow. and uh, well, his, his partner has it's her car really but um yeah we've had a few little we go down and see them down in their house in wales and i used to take the maserati so we'd have the two maseratis outside which was quite a laugh excellent yeah so now you still uh, drive so that? now i had to become a bit more sensible and so i've now got a uh an audi a4 all road um but it's got a pretty decent engine on it actually it's got a it's a it's a diesel but it's a it's a v6 three liter diesel with the sort of the top 
power outputs. It's 272 horsepower wow. and about 405 pounds feet of torque. And so it really goes like a rocket. I mean, I, I didn't, I've never really got into diesel cars. Uh, I never we thought they just don't really go properly. But this one really goes. I mean, it just rockets off the lines, four wheel drive and everything. And it looks completely innocuous. It just looks like, you know, a little, little old car sort of thing, but it just shifts when you put your foot down. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I love nice cars. I mean, my neighbor has a 911 and. Yeah, he let me drive it, although with him in it. Yeah, yeah. and another neighbour has an AC Cobra, which oh yeah, so great. I mean, I I am a bit of a petrol head, so I mean, I I I love these cars. Yeah, I mean, I, I uh, I've got a friend in America who's got an AC Cobra, and they are kind of terrifying. Again, I've never driven it, he's, but he's taken me out in it. And there's like no body, really. You just sort of, you've got this huge engine and four wheels. And like, you're sort of sitting there thinking, well, there's hardly any doors e either. You know, you're sort of like, the ground's racing along. You look over it, my God. But the sound of it, I love the sound. Yeah, oh, it's a massive V8 engine. So they yeah. really. Yeah, give me one of those over Tesla any day. Definitely, yeah. I'm not a big fan of electric cars. I can't really. Well, they're not really electric cars. anyway. They're battery. Yeah, yeah. It's a battery car, right? I, when people say electric, I think a scale electric. Yeah. <laughs> because it's actually plugged into a power source. But this is yeah. not plugged into a power source. So it's really a battery car. They, they, they named it wrong. But anyway, that's another story. So moving on. So tell us a bit about your kind of your education. And you, yeah, you wanted to be what did you, you You said you wanted to be a. So I wanted to. Be, so, yeah, I, that was kind of, you know, when I was a little kid, I was saying to, you know, looking at James Hunt, and people like that. But as I grew up, I pretty uh, realized pretty quickly that that wasn't going to be, you know, on the cards. My I, I come come from quite a working class background. My, my dad was basically worked for the gas board, digging holes in the road. And my mum was a cleaner in, um, in a local firm of solicitors. And so my kind of my next ambition after that was basically just to get to university and get out of this little town I was living in and start to, you know, live a, live a bit and see a bit of the world and that sort of thing. And so I did that and um, I, I studied philosophy in London the first time I went to university and then uh, loved doing that. I thought it was a fantastic subject and really got into it, the whole, you know, sort of thing of philosophy where you can sort of talk about anything and you haven't really got any limits imposed on you and you can sort of deconstruct ideas and work out how things work and how ideas are connected to each other and all that kind of stuff and after that my sort of first job was basically working for the bbc uh as a writer but how did you go from philosophy and studying that into the bbc as a writer uh because i was i had a friend and we start when we were still in school together we started writing scripts comedy scripts and we were into you know the faulty towers and hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy and monty python monty python and that type the, of stuff. the two ronnies i guess the two ronnies i love the two ronnies yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah <laughs> a, bit I, more, a bit more middle of the road but it's yeah it's very it's very well constructed uh, it's exactly. it yeah. brilliant but it, exactly i love the influence on that i, I mean i still recall things today i mean like the hardware store yeah yeah with the four candles and exactly that's <laughs> very good and so afterwards basically we decided that we'd have a go at being writers and just started sending scripts to people at the bbc and one day we were watching television in the middle of the afternoon trying to write a script but instead skiving off watching the telly 
and we saw this um, episode of Chucklevision uh, featuring the inimitable Chuckle Brothers. Mm -hmm. And we thought, oh, we haven't written to the producer of the Chuckle Brothers. We could write this show. It's, you know, it's, it's easy. It's slapstick stuff. We could do slapstick comedy. And so we wrote to him and he wrote back and said, oh, well, send me something. And, you know, then uh, we sent him something and he said, oh, I don't like it. Uh, but tell you what, I'll commission you to write the script. And and that was that, basically. We started, wow. we wrote the script. And but then even he, though he didn't like what you, you sent in, he was still saw value in you writing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think also... Um, he was a bit short of writers at that particular moment. So I think it was one of those serendipitous things yeah. where, you know, you sort of, you're in the right place at the right time. Yeah, um, exactly. I, I love that word actually serendipity in the way that it, I, I don't believe in coincidence. It was meant to be the right place, right time for the right reasons. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I carried on doing that for about 10 years and that this was together with your writing partner yeah well so then we start we we wrote a load of stuff together and then we basically started writing stuff separately and you know i'm making it all sound very sort of easy but it was it was difficult because we were we weren't really making a lot of money it was sort of you know writing a few scripts a year and trying to live on that and then as you get older you want to sort of you know uh get an, nicer place to live and all of that type of thing so it was and a nice oh, car and a nice car yeah i was desperate to get a decent car the minis were you know just losing their appeal for me after about the 10th one or something um and minis weren't so good on the motorway either you know you sort of start like going to meetings we'd have to go to manchester and things and obviously go to see my parents back in wales and stuff driving down the m4 in uh at 70 miles an hour in a mini it's just deafening i mean sort of they're so loud and uh, the engine's screaming away but anyway so um over a sort of period i just i'd started to get interested in copyright law and stuff like that and how sort of the more the kind of business end of writing working and how all that, that sort of was was fitted together so i went back to university and um studied law um part-time just really to learn more about about the sort of the, the the business of of writing of being a creative person um but then that kind of started to take over i met a great bunch of people studying law and they were all you know, there were people who kind of, I was about 30 by then, so there were people like, you know, my age as well. It wasn't just all 21-year-olds. And we kind of formed a knit, tight-knit group together. And so then when I did finish my degree, I decided to, you know, carry on and actually qualify um, as a lawyer and do, you know, finish my training. And then after that, I basically started working as a lawyer doing various things and that's been my career basically for the last 20 years wow but with a focus on copyright yeah yeah i did to start with i did um a lot of employment law and working for you know working in that area but my aim was always to be a copyright lawyer uh and so i started to sort of get more clients in that area and you know build up a practice and that sort of thing by concentrating on on that and gradually this it sort of shifted so like now i'm do pretty much doing 100 percent copyright law and that's all i really do i don't really I'd occasionally I, someone will come to me with something else but that's pretty much everything uh, nothing more for the bbc well so um then about five years ago i had some clients who uh were I uh, wanted to uh, put together a children's television program. And they came to me because they were, they're all, you know, people who made programs, they were all professional people. And they'd worked together on a program 
in the 70s actually and they wanted me to try and get the rights to this program back so they could remake it they lost the rights over the years it sort of all got split up and um it didn't happen i couldn't i couldn't make it work for them like there, there was just they, this the company that had bought the rights had gone bust and then they'd have been sold and then the other uh, company that they'd sold it to had gone bust and so it was just all a mess but anyway we'd all got on very well by this point and so we decided we'd make a new program which was kind of based on the concept of the old program which is a kind of a puppet program called pipkins oh yeah uh, i remember uh, that of, yeah pipkins and so we kind of revitalized it and updated it and made it basically our rate. We raised the money to make it and then sold it to the BBC. And so we're now trying to wait for the BBC to commission another series, but it's sort of they're dragging their heels as always. So, and that show's called Monty and Co. And it's, it's available on iPlayer if you want to go and look for it. And if you've got uh, little kids, sort of under the age of about five or six um i hope they'll they'll like it all right so yeah you, you're doing that in kind of partnership with them yeah so basically we set up a company and uh we'd kind of meet this and this is like sort of yeah going back like five years now we'd meet kind of every weekend and started to just create the program so we knew the kind of basic format that we wanted and so then we just sort of developed the characters developed the setting then we wrote the scripts and at the same time we're trying to raise the money to to make the programs and putting all this kind of finance together and everything um and then finally after kind of again you know making it sound quite easy but after quite a lot of fits and starts and reversals and we had a period where we thought right we're just going to make it for the internet because this is like this is where everything's going to be happening now uh, but it quickly became uh, obvious that there wasn't just enough money in that at that time probably now we're doing it starting again today maybe out of a different idea but and then basically we made the programs we basically got a distributor who's like an agent basically for tv programs and then she was great and she sold it to the bbc wow yeah so i mean it it, it sounds i mean like you said quite straightforward but i mean I, I can imagine i mean if i just look back in the year that has taken me and 11 author co-authors to to write our book i mean these are 11 yeah. previous guests it's been hard work yeah i mean blood sweat and tears literally tears i mean trying to get it done and we're, we're nearly there we're at the kind of finish line now and yeah so to try and write something that for a show must be extremely challenging as well yeah it was it was challenging but it was also kind of liberating because pretty uh quickly we want we decided that we were going to do it ourselves and we just sort of and because there were kind of enough of us but, but maybe not too many so we had there was like a core of five people so we had enough kind of spread of skills to make sure that like everyone was good at something so you know obviously i was good at business but there's another two of the other people are really you know quite have got good business heads on them so i wasn't all on my own doing that i could rely on them for support and you know there are two really good writers and there was you know someone who was really good at writing music and um one of the people basically made all of the puppets i mean he's a, that's what he does he's a professional puppet maker so we could make everything look fantastic and we could just kind of just do what we wanted we weren't sort of hemmed in by you know um uh commissioning executives and people saying oh no we don't like this oh no, you've got to change it we want to we want something that's more like that and then the next week they say oh no we want it back like it was before and you know the sort of thing yeah so so when you make this you actually make it so you have to from the concept to the the actual program and everything is ready to go and then you you kind of sell the yeah. final thing 
yeah yeah that's what we did we basically re- we we made the programs and then as i said we got the distributor and then she made the deal with the bbc so so who writes i mean when you have someone that writes i mean you've got different puppets and things i mean with different voices and whatever the, the, typically the person that's written the script for the puppet would do the voiceover or not necessarily no no um we you know we you'd write the script and obviously you've got the characters by then so you know who the characters are and basically who's going to be playing them but you know so but and one of the uh one of the five of us was the puppeteer he's, he's a again one of the most experienced puppeteers in the country and he's worked he worked on pipkins mm-hmm. he was one of the main puppeteers on spitting image the original spitting image and has you know done loads and loads of stuff he worked for um disney and for uh the muppets and all those types of things so we knew he was going to be he was in control of that but then the rest of the puppeteers were just like were you know they're basically actors who can do puppeteering so we'd just hire them in and some of them were part of the group you know um the main guy knew them but some of them we didn't know. We just we just audition them and hire them if we like them, sort of thing. Excellent. Did you do any voices? No, no, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I was too busy trying to keep the whole show on the road, basically. So. Yeah. But I was there. You know, I was. Um, we had a studio, and I'd be at the studio basically. You know, I kept to the same hours as the the. The shooting so i'd be there like sort of six in the morning seven in the morning and then working all day and then we'd finish up like five in the afternoon or something so so, so when you sold it there, there, there has to be enough money that everybody gets a reasonable amount well not let's say not as much as we like but i mean you know it was the point is it's another step down the road you know and through that we've got merchandising deals and all sorts of stuff so it kind of you know you have to take it one step at a time the bbc will only pay you a certain amount of money particularly with the first series and you don't know how it's going to go and all of that okay so you'll have to share the link for that so people can check it out yeah sure sure i'll do that right and i mean you didn't look at any other kind of tv companies to work with yeah yeah i mean we we uh before we got to this that the point we we went to itv channel five with the sort of their milkshake slot and their milkshake slot what's that that's basically what they call their their sort of um their uh you, you know their their children's package is called milkshake all right okay uh, yeah uh so but basically, we did the, the 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 sort of the hot kind of um, link was the BB, BBC, and actually we've done. Uh, now I come to think of it, you're in you're in Switzerland. We've just done a deal with a Swiss company, or our distributor has. Uh, we've got a French version, um, so I'll try and find out wh- exactly where that is. I'm not actually sure where it is, but you might be on. Do you, do you know Cadoodle? Yes. Yeah, yes. so I think it's on Cadoodle in Switzerland. Oh, excellent. To check it out. Yeah. In in French. In French, yeah. We did a we've done a French dub. We've got a Flemish dub. Um and we're trying to get a German dub together, but it's all proving uh quite complicated because the Germans are telling us they want to take like bits of the programme and not other bits, which is quite complicated so i i, I can imagine like, trying to re-edit it and make it flow yeah yeah so now you are living in london yeah uh, you have your own practice i guess y- yeah so my kind of my day job if you can call it that mm-hmm. is uh as a partner with a firm called gunner cook uh who uh, have got about there's about 200 partners now um but they're a kind of new style of law firm um where basically 
the they hire well they they basically i'm a self although they call me a partner i'm self-employed and i have my own practice and i use them to sort of market that the practice and to do all of the sort of the back office and to provide the insurance and training and networking and all of that type of thing but that basically the practice is is mine to run as i want to so i'm kind of i i can i'd get my own clients and do my own work and all of that that type of stuff right uh, and so you said that's part of the job and what else so, sorry what was that part or was that everything that you do so, well so then uh i have a couple of other sort of jobs well what what the other main job that i have at the moment apart from the laura monty is i run a um sort of collecting society operation so it's kind of uh basically if uh you watch a program on iplayer uh then or other or the itv hub or uh, some some other things then the writer's entitled to a little bit of money and obviously it's it's just not efficient for the writer to 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 claim all those bits of money themselves so basically uh i run a company which basically gets data from all the broadcasters and then divvies up all of the payments to the and then sends them to the to the writers so so if you, you probably know about prs the way that prs works for music for composers so if you basically so if you again if you listen to music like listen to the radio every time a song gets played on the radio mm -hmm. the the um composer and the lyricist could be into, and other people as well but this con concentrate on them they're entitled to a little bit of money uh but again it's impossible for them to kind of keep tabs on that they don't know when their song is going to be played or, or you know who's listening to it and so prs gets all the data send works out who's owed what and sends them the money wow so w basically i had the brilliant idea of doing the same thing um for iplayer um because it's better to copy things from other people and come up with your own ideas so <laughs> that's what i did right um yeah I, I was just thinking i mean when we when we launch our book because there's uh 12 11 12 authors right th yeah. this is a concern also how do we monitor and measure that when people buy the book i mean or th is this something that you get involved in or paul's already got in hand I think you can rely on on Paul. I mean, basically, you're gonna. I I I don't know exactly how you're publishing it, but I guess you'll 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 do a deal with uh with a distributor, and they'll distribute the book, and they'll handle things. Well, I mean, obviously, a lot of the sales will probably go through Amazon, so you know you rely on them to basically to to uh, right. work out what you're owed and send you re reports and. Okay, now he did mention that, and I, I think it's quite straightforward. So rather than 11 12 different accounts you have one and then it's split up accordingly that would be the that would be the the way i would do it yeah i mean I, I think that trying to handle every single little bit is going to be impossible because it, it, there's just too many too many things involved so when you say now because i was particularly interested in obviously having you as a guest because you you cover this copyright i mean for anyone that wants to write and is a budding author uh and then these things have to be taken into consideration i mean now you've written something and it's published how do you recognize that you're owed money when someone buys a book or, or sells it or, or whatever well well yeah you so it really comes down to the to the deals you're signing again and that's kind of where i came in because you know i was i was a in my early 20s i was i knew nothing about law business or anything really i was signing these deals which were with the bbc so i was sort of thinking well it's probably all right but most of the stuff about licenses and assignments and about you know sort of residuals and royalties i didn't know what the hell i was signing 
So that's when I started to think, well, I better try and understand this because yeah, this is my livelihood. If I don't understand it, I mean, I, I could be getting ripped off. Anything could be happening. Exactly. So, so yeah, so you've got to, and that's kind of, so bringing it back up to date, I'm hoping that the, the book will explain to creative people, that's the idea, uh, you know, how copyright works and how they can apply that to their own business relationships because i think it is important that even if you are a creative person if you're particularly if you're trying to make a living from this to look at it in a business-like way and although people might think oh god yeah it's just there's too much to take in and it's not really my thing you've got if and particularly if you don't have an agent or someone looking after it for you you've got to try and understand it i think you've got to because it's your livelihood yeah, exactly. And I, I guess this is a concern for, for lots of authors that people plagiarize and are copying their material as well. Uh, well, yeah, yeah. So that's kind of, you know, that that's part of the my day job in, in Gunner Cook is people come to me and say, yeah, I've been, you know, ripped off. My, my um, I think my book's been copied uh, without my permission or, you know, or I've, I've got suspicions. I sent a script to this producer and I haven't heard anything back from them, but now I hear that he's producing something that sounds exactly like the thing that I sent him, you know, it's all that type of stuff goes yeah. on. I actually have a question. I mean, so just digressing a little bit. So, I mean, I, I have three kids that I I've always started. Well, I started with my first one when he was old enough to understand like a bedtime storytelling. Now, yeah. at, at the beginning, I used to just get the the Mr. Men books because I used to pick yeah. them up at airports and things when I traveled. And then when I came back, uh, I'd read them the bedtime stories of like Mr. Tall, Mr. Small, Mr. Happy, Mr. Whatever. Yeah. Right. And they were great. But then it got to a point that I didn't like so much the story, but I liked the images. Right. So <laughs> I would then change the story. Right? Yeah. And then the create, images. yeah, create <laughs> new stories that I thought were more fitting. Particularly, yeah. I mean, some of the wording that was used was not always appropriate or understandable. Or mm. I just wanted it, it; it didn't flow. So yeah, I, I thought I could make it better. But that, that, that's a, a personal perspective, and so so we did that in, until one day my. My elder son, after exhausting all of these Mr. Men books a dozen times, uh, my son asked me, well, Daddy, what about having my stories about my adventures? So we created our first book. So even though I say I'm not an author, we, we did this for fun. Yeah. But in, in saying that, I've audio recorded hundreds and hundreds now of wow. bedtime stories. Hundreds. So I'm actually... I mean, I, I, I have the first prototype one here. Actually. I'm, yeah. just, I'm just going to share that quickly with you. It's here. Oh, amazing. <laughs> Going to the moon. Right. And then it has got kind of all the, the graphics. Uh, yeah, nice. About going to the moon and him with his rabbit. And, 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 and so Oh, on. lovely. Now, I, actually, I found an illustrator now through Paul. So I, I know we're digressing a little bit here, but I think it's it is kind of on the theme. So, yeah. so, so he's put me in touch with because we're working with Paul. I mean, th th there's dozens and dozens of great authors, and some people are are, are well known to writing, and others are complete newbie. Right? Yeah, and we got a ton of stuff to learn. But it's great when you're learning in a group. And you're not on your own because all the frustrations and the procrastination that you haven't written for months and you can't bring yourself to doing it and you've you've gone brain dead with trying to think of what to write it's great because other people feel exactly the same yeah and you're not alone in the way you think oh i'm not a writer everybody's a writer it's just that you need some people who need a bit more help than others yeah no absolutely so, yeah so with this now, we want to create a series of books and with audio books as well. So yeah, how, sounds terrific. When, when I, the, the, the question is going back to the Mr. Men ones, the, the, the question is because we use names, like we don't say 
Mr. Happy and Mr. That. So we're not really referring to the Mr. Men books, but if we if we say that because we talk about going to the bakers, right? And and when the the, the lady behind the in the baker shop, we call her uh, Mrs. Baker Lady, right? Now, would that be deemed like? Oh, you can't say Mrs. Baker Lady because it could be a Mr. Man or a Mr. Policeman. No, or... no. I mean, basically, names are one of those things that don't uh, that copyright doesn't really apply to. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's sort of always been there's always been a kind of rule that people have tried to get round, and it's never quite worked that that names and titles are not something that you can protect by copyright. Because they're kind of basically th thought to be too, too short and not original enough. So I don't think you have any trouble with that. The, the sort of the issue maybe is if you follow the stories from the Mister Men books too closely, and the sort of plot development points are the same as you would you, you you've got from something else. Because to cut is because infringement of copyright can occur not just when you kind of copy actual lumps of text but when you kind of fought when you, if you if you copy an original narrative sequence or plot or something like that yeah we're not copying the plot sometimes like we change the name like it, like mr nobody it, it is great Be and I mean, when I was just like doing the story using yeah. the the Mister Men books, Mister Nobody was a Brummy, right? right? So he had a Brummy accent, right? So I put on these accents, right? Yeah, it was, like, it was so funny. So we kind of took his books to a different level, right? Yeah. So really, we we plagiarized them, but for fun, right? Uh, for the kids, so we we didn't sell them or anything. We we were just telling stories, but looking at the story and making it our story rather than the generic one it was yeah so yeah so there's sort of there's a there's a limit to which again copyright doesn't apply that that the sort of if there's material that's just generic and obviously you know the although i'm never quite sure w exactly what they are but it's like they say there's only seven plots or whatever it is you know uh so if it's at that kind of level, it's not infringement of copyright because you, because you're taking stuff that's not actually original to the thing that you're taking it from. If you see what I mean, you know. Yes, so I do, like, yeah. if you if you write a like a, a, a uh, like a historical romance or something like that, then there's going to be things that in in pretty much every historical romance or whatever that is going to be the same you know there's going to be you know the meeting there's going to be a falling out there's going to be a reconciliation you know so you can't say oh well you've you, you've uh, infringed my copyright because the, the the couple get together at the end you know i mean no no one can no one could copyright stuff like that oh excellent okay okay that, that's kind of reassuring uh i mean this is another project of mine but getting back to you so tell us now because the audience are probably waiting to know what are you going to write about what are you writing about and is this your first book yeah so this is this is the first book that i've that i've written um my other sort of the writing that i've done previous has been basically scripts uh and the book is called copyright made easy and as I hope the title is pretty self-explanatory. It's trying to explain copyright in terms that non-lawyers and uh, people who you don't have any kind of experience of copyright law can understand. Like me. Yeah, well, and but in particular, creative people. Well, I am creative. You are creative. Yeah, I'm sure you're <laughs> creative. We've seen your book. We've seen you know all the things you're doing. So I don't doubt that. And so the, one of the things, and it took quite a while to kind of develop this sort of concept, but the idea is, is that I try and tell the story of copyright through actual works rather than just saying, well, there's this, this law and that law, and there's a case here and a case there, and telling you all about that. 
there is a bit of that obviously there has, has to be but i try and explain things by using actual works so that there's just kind of more to get your teeth into and if you're creative you you know it'll just be kind of i hope feel more kind of natural to talk about books and songs and paintings and tv programs and films and things like that it'll be just kind of easier to assimilate all right so you cover quite uh, a big area then yeah it's not that long a book but um it's uh you know it try try and cover again not just the sort of basics of copyright of what copyright is and how it exists and everything but also kind of how it works how you can apply it to your creative life uh and the things you need to be aware of i talk a bit about you know sort of contracts option agreements and assignment agreements and licenses and trying to explain how they work as well how they kind of all interconnect no i i, I love it i i think it'd be nice to read a book like that first before you venture out actually writing a book because yeah. at least you'll have an under understanding and an idea of what to expect yeah so uh, let's so so it's called copyright made easy yeah right so it, it just makes me think when you you say that because i i grew up in the days where yeah i i saw on the bookshelves like a uh, dummy's guide to things yeah. or the idiot's guide to things so i mean i i would actually buy those because i wanted it in the simplistic terms that actually get it right and sometimes i felt embarrassed buying that but other people were buying them as well and when you go around to friends house you see the same everyone's buying the same book so so we do need a hand holding and an, a simple understanding otherwise we just don't get it so it's yeah. done in that kind of way yeah man no, absolutely and that was kind of uh one of the inspirations as well because i've got loads of those i'm always i was always buying those books when i wanted to try and find out about something and didn't understand it because i think another thing is you know in the, some of the and some of the books are better than others obviously but the but the good ones have a really kind of easy way of explaining things i try to break things down so it's not just sort of this 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 and this it sort of will tell a bit of a story and you know make the what they're trying to explain to you um easier to assimilate uh so yeah so i that that was kind of an inspiration as well okay so it's going to be so where are you in getting it published i mean what stage are you at so uh paul has uh ordered the proof copies and i'm expecting to get one anytime soon and so we're hope pretty near to actually getting published getting there i think he's talking about having a sort of soft launch to start with where i think basically you put it on amazon i'm not entirely sure what the plan is but i think it's something like that so you do that first and then you kind of build up a bit of interest in it right so uh, you've got a uh, cover for it as well mm -hmm. yeah i can i can um send you a link to the cover okay so i'll put the cover on on here so people can see it as well yeah so and it's going to be available in a in a hard in a physical copy uh, yeah and what else uh as a uh, ebook and i've also done a audio book right so with audio because we're, we're going to do the three as well right i mean we were asked do we want to do the audio ourselves or do we want a professional kind of voiceover person to do it for us and yeah i was thinking the professional voiceover person but then there's a lot of pushbacks and you should do it yourself yeah so what are you doing so yeah i've done the recording myself and again i was kind of quite nervous about it to start with and i was worried about how it would all come over but um uh dean who did it again who works with paul he made everything really easy for me uh as a complete novice doing this and uh i think that it is better to do it yourself if you can if you if you, you know, if you feel confident enough to do it because i i think that when you write it you because i could i could i could speak the book as i've written it and i guess if you uh were a kind of 
professional um, voiceover artist or something, you'd kind of, you could get to learn that. But I think that, that I would, that, that my kind of delivery will explain the book better than probably anyone else could have done it. You've got to, because I know what I'm talking about, basically, and they probably wouldn't. So however clear they were uh, in the way that they they spoke, I think there's that kind of inflection and intonation and things, the speed, the way, the, the, the speed you speak and, you know, the pauses and all that type of stuff that is better, particularly for a book like this. I mean, maybe for a, if you, if you like talking about a, a novel or a fictional book, then, you know, probably a, a professional actor is going to be better at conveying the meaning of that. But I think for a, a, a kind of book like this, you've got to know what you're talking about a bit. Yeah, no, I love what you said there. And it's made me think twice about having mine because doing our audios, be, because they're very personal stories. Yeah. Uh, like exactly what you said you know the story you know kind of that emotion that you're feeling you know where to have that intonation and and that pause and and that like kind of gasp of breath or whatever i mean yeah that comes across in the way when i read it or how i've written it that's how i'm expressing it but if you don't have that with the voiceover person they they're just reading a script basically yeah no, that, that that's good to know and, and good to share. Yes, yeah, well, I, would, I would definitely have a go at it. And I know, um, you know, uh, what I did with Dean is I sent him a kind of sample to start with. Mm -hmm. And he was very encouraging and said, look, you're not going to have any problems. I can tell, you know, that, you know, you, you speak clearly enough and you sound, your voice sounds fine. See, every, everyone's worried that they sound terrible in recordings, but. Like that, no, that that's very true because when I started recording the bedtime stories with the kids, I think, oh shit, listen to him. Look, it's the village idiot. Yeah. Right? <laughs> <laughs> right? But I think that's your own because you don't really hear yourself speak no. how others hear you. Yeah. And then when you hear it in a recording, that's how they hear it. And I think it's a big shock, actually. Yeah. Yeah, so, I really used to hate my voice. I really used to hate it. Uh, but anyway, Dean persuaded me that uh, it was going to be all right. It's funny how it grows on you. Having done all of these recordings, like, like as, you said, as we said, you're the 142nd guest. I had to get used to myself. Yeah. And it's funny now, I've got used to my own voice, how it hears from someone else. And I know it's me now, whereas before I used to like shudder and like cower <laughs> away and think, oh, no, that's not me. And is that really me? Do I really sound like that? And But you do get used to it and it kind of grows on you after a yeah. while. So, no, I mean, what you've said definitely makes perfect sense. So you you don't have a launch date yet? I mean... No, no, Paul is uh, putting together the plan for that. So, but it should all come together in the next couple of weeks. Okay, but you mentioned a soft launch first. So, well, that's what he was talking about. Uh, the, the, when I spoke to him, I think we sort of did about the, what was it, about the eighth copy of the sort of proof version. And so that's what he was talking about then. Okay. So okay. but I, if, I, if, if he can come up with some dates, I'll let you know as well. Yeah, so you... also for promoting, I mean, do you do it? Do you do it? Does he do it? I mean, what, what's the plan? So I'm going to be doing a lot of promotion. Uh, again, we've, we've still got to kind of work out, but he, Paul, was very keen on TikTok, oh, uh, yeah. which I've never used. So I've got to learn that, and we're going to be doing – um you know some little sort of snippets and bits and pieces for that and then i've got i've started sort of to put the book out to a few contacts that i've got as well to see if i can get some interest 
there and you know sort of writing organizations and whatever i can get really i'll be yeah I'll be you, you mentioned that you had this kind of consortium of like like-minded lawyers when you got together doing this study uh, would they be good people to, to to share that with as well yeah kind of um and uh yeah you know i'm basically I'm, I'm trying to work all the contacts that i've, I've got to see what interest i can i can right. okay so i mean i typically use linkedin as a, a business social media yeah uh, and actually i typically post the the event i mean now so i mean a little behind on some stuff so i mean i will then use this as an opportunity to also share this video link there yeah so people can see that and any other yeah, information that would be great. yeah i mean at the moment linkedin is about the only thing that i use so uh but yeah that that that's a good a good resource as well because I've, I've got got quite a few hundred um followers on linkedin or whatever it is connections or yeah yeah exactly oh, so, okay i um, mean yeah and anything to to help and also to to help push it because we're going to be in the same boat shortly definitely and, yeah. and i mean for us we have like more authors so i mean as a collective book so it, it should make it a little bit easier but nevertheless any help that we all get this is the idea also i mean within the other authors that we haven't met it's good to for your book is good good also for them so i mean th th there's many many great things that can transpire from doing something like this and also to understand like how people write and their thought process yeah so, so how long is it taking you to write this you really want to know <laughs> yes i do yeah <laughs> right so well, Paul may dispute this, but I'm going to say six years. Six years? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. I, I thought we were bad. I mean, but then, like, for the first year, I didn't really know what I was doing. Um, and then, obviously, I've had a lot of other things happening. So it got written in, in bits. I'd write a bit, I'd write a chunk, then other stuff would take over and I'd have to, you know, put it aside for six months. And then I'd start again uh, and then start again. And so it really started to come together like it, during the lockdown, really, when I had a bit more time and I could really start to kind of knit all the bits together and finish it off. So roughly how big is it? Uh, it's about 160 pages, something like that. All right. So how many words would that be roughly? To be honest, I don't really know. Um because we're going on word count. So Yeah. Is that like what, about forty, fifty thousand words? Oh right, okay, that's probably about that. Yeah. We we're doing right. kind of five, six thousand words each. Yeah. As our chapters. About right. Some more, some less, but I mean round about that yeah but but uh, I, I i know i mean we've got within hours just, just as a, an example we've got people that have their own books already so they've gone through this process there uh, we've got people like me complete newbies right and yeah and and, and there's always 101 excuses why we don't all move forward at the same time which is quite a challenge. So we've got the ones that are kind of yeah, second fiddle to this. They're, they're pretty good at it. And within a matter of months, they had it all written, reviewed a dozen times, polished and ready. Yeah. Others hadn't even written a word. Right. Yeah. And yeah, huge challenges. But we're, we're now there. We're pretty much there. We've still got pretty much everybody in it right who i actually for the ones that really couldn't keep the momentum going they are moving to the second book right, right? so they, they, we're not losing them all together they're just moving to the second book right so 
Yeah, yeah. Well, that sounds sounds good. I mean, people, well, as you can tell, people work at different speeds. I mean, I write pretty quickly once I get down to it. The problem is getting down to it and giving yourself the time. So, you know, in the last couple of years, it's really gone, you know, gone really well. And I'd meet Paul pretty much every week for a period to edit it. And we've sort of, we did endless edits we must have gone through the whole book at least sort of five times um and making changes and just kind of getting the shape of it right so yeah i don't know how he he does it because the time and effort that is taking me and then he's doing it just with our group alone and that's yeah. 12 of us yeah right and i i'm on my which i think is pretty good going the 12th revision right yeah 5,000 words and I think how, how's that possible I mean it's unbelievable yeah th th there is some that are on their like 20th revision mm. and I think how how but I mean I I have taken the time and effort to to read theirs and I can see the improvements I can see where it's going and and we all offer feedback and then yeah I'm on my 12th but I I ask my mum this time to review and she's given me some reviews that I think oh no I might have to make even more revisions and, <laughs> yeah. and I don't know if you can actually please everybody well you can't no I mean you've got to you've got to sort of say there's a kind of there's a line and you can say well no actually I want to keep it like this you know that this, this it's important and I can justify why I want it to be like this. Um, and I think you've got to, you've got to get to that point because it's your book in the end, you know, so you've got to, yeah, it, yeah there's got to be a line. Yeah. I think um, I'm good to go. Although Paul maybe wouldn't agree and I'll have to do even do more changes, but yeah, we've got to get to a point that we, like you said, put a line in the sand and, and move forward. Otherwise it'll never be finished. Yeah. And use this as a learning for the next book yeah so yeah, will you exactly. will you write another book now yeah i just don't know what i'd write i mean these the sort of we've got a sort of plan to sort of expand the sort of series um but again i'm gonna have to think about how i'm gonna do that um and i, I think some of it will depend on how this book goes i mean if people like it and then want more then i'll kind of I'll know the direction to go in, but if people say this is terrible, I hate it, you know, then I'll have to think of something else. Yeah, why why don't you do a book writing made easy? Well, we kind of thought of doing that. That was sort of one of the sort of base ideas was to then kind of write just sort of like books that, that would concentrate on a particular area. So like copyright for book writers or novelists or whatever and then book writers for screenwriters uh, copyright for screenwriters for photographers for whoever 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 so that's one idea um but then i've got to kind of think well how am i going to actually tell that story is it good is, is there enough new material there am i going to just have to repeat everything i've already said which isn't very appealing for either me or the reader um so i don't know i don't know what what i'm gonna do i've got to have a kind of think i i think for anyone writing particularly i mean what i've seen in, i mean for us it's been a year right? yeah or just over a year right we paul always said it'll take 12 to 18 months depending on the speed of the group and he's been pretty accurate in that and I thought how does it take so long to write a book but then I actually getting to know some of the other authors that have come back after like long pauses right they're, they're similar to you I mean yeah. I mean some three four five years later and they've come back to finish the book and I'm thinking wow it, book writing is not easy no it isn't no no, you, you really, you've got to think about it. If you want it to be any good anyway, you've got to, you know, you've got to really think about what you're doing and how it's all fitting together. You can't just knock it off 
Well, I can't anyway. Maybe. Yeah, maybe I, I, that's what months. I was thinking. I'll, I'll just spend a weekend, write something, and then be done in a month. That's what I was th- thinking at the beginning. Yeah. <laughs> right. That that month never ever started because I I didn't even know how to start the first word. Yeah, well, that is always the, the most difficult thing, isn't it? The blank. Yeah, and, yeah. And like, as I was saying, you know, it took me probably a year to, to work out what I was going to do, just sort of thinking, well, yeah, you know, there, there's 101 books about copyright law. Uh, why, is, why is anyone going to read my book? You know, you can go on Wikipedia and, and they've got a perfectly good, you know, clear explanation of copyright. Well, why would someone buy a book when uh, you could just look at Wikipedia? So you've got to kind of think of well, you know, you've got to you've got to add that something extra to it. You've got to you've got to make people, you know, make it easier for people or make it more attractive or whatever. Tell them the story. Yeah, I hope give them a laugh or two. Okay. Um, you know, I mean, I'm I like I was a comedy writer, so I like to tell jokes. So. One of the Paul was always editing out my jokes, and I would say, oh, "I like I like that joke. It's funny." And he'd say, "Oh, well, it's pointless. What's it? What, you know, why are you telling this stupid joke?" Oh yeah, he said he, he said things like that to me as well. He said, "What'd you write that for?" And he said, "Why'd you keep writing the same thing a dozen times?" I said, I, I, "Am I?" And he said, "Yeah, read that. You're saying it the same thing, yeah. just in a dozen, a few different ways, but you said the same thing." My yeah. mum actually said that. You're too repetitive. I, 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 <laughs> no, no. <laughs> yeah. they, they, they don't pick up on the value. No. They, they, they pick up on the critique in a way that you, you're too repetitive. And I'm thinking, no, what about the good stuff? Well, yeah, you know, and what, what do they say? <laughs> you know, you've got to you've got to tell people what you're going to tell them. You tell them and then you tell them what you've told them. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. Sometimes you have to be repetitive, but people don't get it. it uh, the number of times I've said that to Paul. Yeah. <laughs> so, look, you know, this is difficult to understand. So I've got to kind of, you know, I've got to kind of break it down a bit. I've got to kind of, you know, go so far and then I've got to kind of, you know, come yeah. back to it. And- exactly. I mean, I I used to be sales guy in sales and used to tell customers something. And then the, no sooner the meeting finished, in the coffee break, they're asking me the thing I've already told them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I look at it this way: isn't it better to be too repetitive than, and they get it rather than not at all? Yeah. But like you, I, I like stories. I, I like to tell things in a story format. In in a way, with it, like this show. I mean, yeah, I, I don't want to just know about what you're doing now I, I like the build up I like where you come from your background and everything else it, it, it's the whole package yeah actually one guest said to me it's like uh, it's like this is your life right <laughs> and this is, you, you could be the, bring out the red book yeah exactly bring out the red book yeah. and say this is this is your life <laughs> right but anyway well that, that was a compliment so I like that yeah yeah definitely so anyway, we're just going to kind of wrap things up now. So, uh, yeah, looking forward to your book. I'll share the links and everything. Uh, the recordings will be on YouTube. Uh, the audio will be on Spotify, and it's automatically copied across to Rumble as well. You can do what you wish with it. So if you want to help promote it, then use this as well so people get to know who you are. Mm, I'm sure and, yeah. Is there any kind of closing kind of comments, remarks, or something you want to share with us before we wrap it up? Uh, I don't know, really. It's been really um, great talking to you, James. It's been fun. You said it, you'd make it easy, and you certainly have. It's just been like having a little little chat with a friendly, knowledgeable guy. So um, I've really enjoyed it. Yeah. Uh, podcast made easy. Yeah. Podcast made easy. Brilliant. What a great idea for a book. Yeah, we could do it together, right? <laughs> yeah, because uh, it's kind of your made easy bit that yeah. you could have a series of that. You, actually, that, that's just made me think. You could go to different authors that are experts in different fields. Yeah. And they, their field made easy. Yeah. I'm sure Paul's got that in mind. 
No, I, I think I thought of it first. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so it's, Robert, it's been an absolute pleasure. Yeah, been we're, great to speak to you. Yeah, we're likewise. We're in touch anyway because we're using the publishing mastery platform of Paul's. Yeah, right, and yeah, we'll share this also within there so that other authors can can check it out and yeah we'll share the links and everything and i i, I think for what you said i've learned a lot already right. and that's part of the purpose of the show i mean to educate people so so thank you very much for that and i, I love the car bit as well so yeah yeah great talking cars i could do that all day excellent okay <laughs> so once again thank you very much yeah speak to you yeah. soon Look yeah have a great evening yeah. cheers thank bye you. bye Wow, that was another featured business brought to you by Visibility Impact. If you'd like to be our next featured guest or learn how James Mofad can help you leverage on the art and power of interactive storytelling for your business, reach out and schedule a call now. 